Hello and welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Hello, I'm your host Rocco, and with me today, our special guest is Michael Hall. Michael, how are you? I'm doing good. All right, so there are going to be a lot of people that know you, and there are going to be a lot of people that don't know you. So you have worked for many different companies that people will know, like Canonical, Endless OS, and so on. Um, but let's start at the beginning. Who is Michael Hall personally? That, that's the loaded question there. Um, <laughs> uh, it, when you get right down to it, I'm just a guy who likes building things and helping people. And, you know, that's been my entire career has been built on one or both of those two things. All right. So do you have any hobbies outside of the Linux computer open source world? I do, yeah. Um, so I, I'm pretty big into barbecue, uh, low smoke, southern style barbecue. So that, uh, that's kind of become my thing over the years. Whenever there's a holiday or a big family gathering, I break out the smoker and cook up a bunch of food for everyone. I love it. Um, so tell us the secret nobody else will know. Tell us a secret. The secret to ingredient it. is... <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Right. But, um, so I really take an open source, the, the open source philosophy to, to a lot of life. So if anybody actually wants to know what's in my rub, um, I can tell you that. I can't tell you how much of everything's in my dry rub because I never wrote it down. And every time I make it, I make it a little bit different. Basically throwing stuff into a bowl and mixing it until it tastes right. Right. Hey, that's exactly how my grandmother used to cook. She would, she didn't have a recipe laying around. She would throw, throw some, uh, seasonings and spices and whatever into whatever she was making. And it would just be to the taste of it. So mm -hmm. yeah. that's the way my wife is. And it, it throws me sometimes because she'll ask me to like take the cake out of the oven when it's done. And I look and there's no timer set. So I say, okay, well, when's it done? She goes, when it smells done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's it. When it smells done. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. There are uh, a few barbecue connoisseurs in the Telegram group of Biddle. So if you want to let us know what's in your rub. I can do that. All right. So you have worked for companies like Canonical, Endless OS, um, EdgeX Foundry. Is that how you say that? Uh, yeah, that's actually a project within the Linux Foundation. Okay. Um, so is that your current day job? Yep. I am currently a developer advocate with the Linux Foundation. I am specifically on their LF Edge set of projects, which are all about uh, edge computing. Very nice. So how, so you're a, let's, let's go back a little bit. You're a um, computer user. How do you start working for Canonical? Like, how does that happen? Uh, so... I was a developer for most of my career. Well, maybe not most now. I've probably been doing this almost as long. Wow, I'm old. Never mind. <laughs> um, so, so I started out as a, a software developer. Uh, I did a lot of web development for companies in my area. And uh, one of the companies I was working for, when I first started there, they, uh, they gave me a CentOS workstation, which was the first time that I'd ever used Linux on a desktop before. And one of my coworkers at the time, not long after I started, brought in an Ubuntu CD. Uh, I think it was like 5.04 or 5.10, something like that. The real, real early version. And he gave it to me. He's like, man, you got to check this out. It's really cool. <laughs> uh, 
So so I did, and yeah, it was really cool, but I, I didn't switch at that point. I was still a Windows user. But I got interested in, in the Ubuntu community. And uh, one of the things that the Ubuntu community has is uh, what are called local teams. They're local community teams. Uh, and I found out that there were some people near me in Central Florida that were part of this Florida Ubuntu local team. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go meet some of them. That should be interesting. So I went to a couple of their meetups and became friends with somebody there who was working at Canonical. Um, and he encouraged me to get involved with the, the global community more. And at the time, I was doing web development with uh, Django. And Ubuntu had some web projects that were in Django. So I thought, hey, that, that seems like a good fit. I can jump in and start uh, contributing to those. So I got, uh, I got started working on the local team portal, actually, for the, uh, for the Ubuntu community. Um, and I spent probably a couple of years contributing like that, and then started applying for Canonical. Uh, so, so I got in at Canonical based on my web development work, and actually, I was a web developer there originally. And then you progress further on in Canonical. Uh, so, I had been working with the community team because they were the ones responsible for that web project I was working on. Um, so, I already knew guys like John O'Bacon, uh, George Castro, uh, Daniel Holbach, and David Planella. Already knew them, uh, met them at one of the UDSs that was in Orlando. So when they had an opening on their team, I'm like, oh man, I know these guys. I like them. We're friends. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but you know, up until that time, I was just a developer. I didn't do public facing things. I didn't go talk to people. I, I showed up at my desk and I sat down and I punched in code into a computer and then I went home. So it was. I wasn't sure about it, and I almost talked myself out of uh, even talking to Jono about it several times. Um, but finally decided to take the leap, talk to him about it. And he's like, oh yeah, you'd be perfect for this. So, <laughs> hey, all all my, my doubts and worries, I guess, were unfounded. Right. Um, so where, where do you progress to? The community manager area or what? Yeah, uh, at Canonical, each of the community managers on the team had kind of a specialized focus, even though we all worked together on the same project. Um, some of us were focused on translations, some were focused on QA work, some were focused on like, core dev and packaging. Uh, and because I had a developer's background, my focus was largely on developers. So I was already doing kind of developer advocacy uh, in that role. Right. And I've really kind of stuck with that ever since. So how long did you continue that? I was in that role for, I think, almost six years. Very nice. Um, you have gone through uh, community manager positions now through your career, um, especially during that time. It's got to be something that you love to do because it's not always an easy job. It is. You know, like I said, I'm I'm a guy who likes to build things and help people, and being a community manager is those two things exactly. Well, it takes a special talent to be able to bring people together and for the better, better outcome for the whole. And like I said, that takes a special talent to do that. And we appreciate that. Thank you. I, I appreciate the community. You know, it's really, it's been such a wonderful journey. I'm glad that I made the leap out of where I was into this kind of role because I have made so many friends and so many connections and had so many experiences that I ne never would have had otherwise. Well, I normally ask people about uh, their journey into Linux. So let's talk about the first computer that you ever used. Okay, wow. Um, <laughs> the first PC computer that I ever used, not counting the like, Apple IIs that my elementary school had. Um, but the, the first computer that was in my house was an Office Mate, I think was the brand. It was one of those, uh, those beige box uh, IBM PC compatible. Uh, you know, this was, this was 1990, 1991. Yeah. So it, was, it was a 386. I think it had a whopping 10 megabyte hard drive <laughs> and I don't know, 
two or three bits of RAM, probably. Uh, it didn't run much. It ran DOS, and it, there was a, a paint program in DOS. And I think there might have been like a Carmen San Diego game or something like that, but I honestly don't remember being able to do a whole lot with this computer. Um, but my dad won it in a contest, and so we had it, and my brother and I played on it as much as we possibly could. Well, that's the thing. I love talking about those types of computers. I can't say that I'd want to go back and use them yeah. now, but I mean, I love talking about it because at the time they were great. Like I didn't have the experience in computers until later, but even the first, even going so far as like gaming consoles, like, you know, Atari and all this stuff, all of those first, they, they were awesome. They would probably yeah. be lousy today, but they were awesome then. They were so innovative at the time. Like this wasn't a, there wasn't a steady progression really, you know, technology wise there might've been, but like the Atari 2600 just kind of exploded into the market and built this whole kind of market that wasn't there before. Right. So you progress on from that first computer to getting your own personal computer? Um, no, we, well, we had a couple of family computers uh, along the way. Um, I, I distinctly remember we, we, the second computer we had had Windows 3.1 on it. And I distinctly remember at one point having a stack of like 20 three and a half inch floppy drives to upgrade this computer to Windows 95. Um, and at this point, it was really, it was my brother's and my computer. My parents didn't really do anything with it. Um, so, you know, we, he and I would just spent an afternoon popping one disc out, putting another disc in, waiting. <laughs> um, but, but we got Windows 95 installed on it. Um, that was the, the computer that I first got on the internet with um, through a free dial-up account that had no software. Uh, so we convinced my parents to buy us a modem, the like 2400, uh, or 24K modem or something like that. Um, but had no software. So we had to get the Windows console, uh, the, the serial console, pointed at the serial port this modem's connected to. And then we went through this manual to learn all of the commands to actually tell the modem how to dial and then how to log in um, once we were dialed up. And how did you learn all this as kids like that? Well, I mean, we were, we were 13, 14 years old. and we had heard rumors about what the internet was like. And so we were going to do whatever it took to figure out how to get online. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I think it, th that was such a formative experience. It wasn't just that here's a computer. It works. Don't question it. It was here's a computer. It doesn't work. Here's a manual. Learn how to fix it. And, I, and it, you know, that kind of set me on the path that, you know, hey, computers are something I can make do what I want them to do, even if it's not what they're currently doing. Right. You know, so I'm not sure kids these days have that same kind of experience early on. Now, I mean, they're introduced to computers way earlier than I was, but not in that sense, not yeah, in they, the build it sense. They're never really like broken in a way that you can fix. Right. All right. So you progress on. Um, how long is it until you till that guy talk tells you about CentOS? Oh, uh, well, that that was a while, um, probably ten years later. Uh, so, one of my first jobs while I was still in high school, I was working for a small little ISP in my hometown. That uh, they they had dial-up customers and then they hosted websites, and. Uh, my brother got a job there. He, he was a graphic designer, so he was you know, doing graphic design web work for them. He said, hey, if you learn HTML, I'll probably get you hired on here. So uh, he, he lent me one of the company's like, HTML for Dummies book, and I learned just enough HTML to get that job. Uh, but they, they ran all of their web servers off of old Spark stations. Um, the, the guy who was running the company I guess in a previous job, he, he had used these, so he was familiar with them and would just buy 
old spark stations off eBay. And so, you know, before I really experienced Linux, I was using Solaris. Right. Uh, so, so I was familiar with Unix already. Uh, but the weird thing uh, about depending on secondhand spark stations for your company's critical infrastructure is that they start to get hard to find. <laughs> and, and finding replacement hardware is hard. And even finding like copies of Solaris is hard. Um, so I, I remember several times you know, they were struggling to find new servers to, to expand capacity. And at the time, Netscape had just announced that they were going to open source Netscape 5. So this was before Mozilla and everything. And I remember that announcement because I was like, what do you, what do you mean you're just going to give away the source code? And let anybody have it. That's crazy. Nobody. That's not how software works. <laughs> um, but I went and I downloaded a copy of the source code anyway, and I had no idea what it was. But I was just fascinated by this idea that people were giving away the instructions on how to build these things. Um, and from there, somehow I I heard about Linux. I'm not sure how exactly that progressed. Um, but at the time, you could buy box sets of Linux at Best Buy. Um, there were there were two box sets. There was a Red Hat box set, and then there was a uh, Caldera Open Linux, which is what became SCO. Yep. Um, and they were significantly cheaper than Red Hat, so that's the one that we bought. <laughs> um, was it significantly harder <laughs> as well? Uh, I don't know. I never used that old version of Red Hat. So <laughs> probably it was, yeah. Uh, so at that point, we had retired the old computer that my, my parents bought us when we were teenagers. And it was, it was like a, a Pentium 1 something. Not very powerful, but compared to you know, a really old Spark station, it was, it was kind of comparable. So I thought, hey, let's, let me bring this in. I will put this Linux thing on there and see if I can make something that can host websites the same way these Solaris boxes do, because we can find these old PCs cheap and easy now. Right. Uh, so, so I ended up putting uh, this Caldera Open Linux on there, and it had like KDE 1. something, the, the, the one that still looked like a really bad version of Windows 95. Oh, my. Um, and so, so I got it all installed. It was a couple of CDs. I got it all installed, and it could not connect to the network. It had a network card in it, Everything was plugged in fine. I knew it was working because it was working when it had Windows on there, um, but it was not doing anything. And I found out it was because it didn't have the, the network card driver. So I dug into my you know, Windows experience. I'm like, okay, let's go find a driver file online somewhere to download and run the executable and install it. Um, but everything I was finding online wasn't providing me the file. It was just saying, load the Tulip driver, load the Tulip driver. I have no idea what it's talking about. Um, so I finally start looking through the contents of the CD, and I find a Tulip file. It's like tulip.lo uh, or something like that. So I, I figure out, I was about to say I Google how to do it, but there wasn't Google then. Right. Um, this whole episode is just going to be me dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I eventually find the command to what I thought was install this Linux driver because it was like ints mod or something. Um, I don't know if it was, it was that specific command or if that one's something newer. But I remember I ran a, a, a command on this file and it went right back to the command prompt. Like, well, that was useless. It didn't do anything. But then I was online. Like, how, how did that work? I just, I just ran this one command on this one file. That, that shouldn't be enough to make this work. But it was. But it was. That was all it took. Um, and so, so I went from being frustrated with this, you know, cheap knockoff of Solaris to, like, having my mind blown about, it's that easy? <laughs> did you go back to those forums or those questions and when they said, just load the tulip driver? Uh, <laughs> Did you add there? Just do it. <laughs> Probably not. 17-year-old me was not a good uh, open source citizen uh, at the time. 
So you get these uh, these drivers loaded. You get online. Do you convince yep. uh, him to run Linux? No. <laughs> but but I got MySQL installed, and I got Apache installed, and I got all of my Perl programming stuff installed, which was way easier than it was on Solaris because like all the Perl CPAN modules were made for GNU tools and would regularly fail to install on Solaris. So like I was happy with it. I thought it was great. Um, you know, it had a graphical interface I could do stuff with. It, it ran all the software I wanted it to run. Um, so, so I was happy with it. Them not so much. <laughs> so um, now that you get this taste of Linux in you, uh, where, where do you go next? I still only thought about Linux as server software at that point. I, I didn't consider it as something for a desktop. Uh, it, it wasn't an alternative to Windows in my mind at that point. Uh, so so I, went, I jumped from job to job. I was doing contract development. So I was only somewhere for six months to a year before my contract was up, and I'd go somewhere else. And I learned different uh, programming languages and uh, different tool sets and stuff and kind of gravitated towards open source for a little while. Not so much as a member of the community, just as you know, a, a consumer of software. There were a couple of jobs I got where we were using some open source tool and something was wrong with it. It didn't have a feature or a feature didn't work quite right. Um, and I was able to, because it was open source, I was able to find what was wrong, fix it, and then convince my management chain to let me contribute that patch back upstream, which at that time was a lot harder than, uh, than I hope it is now inside these proprietary companies. <laughs> uh, because I, at, at one point, I was in an email thread with a lawyer trying to convince them that I wasn't giving away valuable company IP. Oh my. To fix, it, it was a fix to, um, it was a Java library to produce Excel files. So I'm like, you know, we, we don't sell software to make Excel files. It, it was a bank and they wanted to be able to export um, a, a customer's you know, bank history, uh, bank ledger as an Excel file. I'm like, we're not selling the technology to make Excel files. This is just a feature. <laughs> and if we don't submit it back upstream, we're going to have to apply this to every update from the software that we get. So there was a lot of back and forth involved in that before we finally got approval to, uh, to send that patch upstream. Yeah, I'm sure that's got to be, well, that had to be a pain then. Uh, it's got to be easier than that now. I would hope so. At least in most companies, it, in banks, it might still be that much of a pain just because they're <laughs> banks. Maybe. <laughs> um, but it, it was during this, uh, this contract job hopping that uh, I got introduced to Ubuntu. And it was not too long after that that I made the switch to Ubuntu full-time. Um, at that point, I had already switched most of my daily tools over to open source. Uh, so I had Firefox. I had um, GIMP. I was using Eclipse. Or uh, there, there's a couple other open source editors that I was using. So it wasn't so much of a big change for me at that point to switch over to Ubuntu. So how was that first experience when you first installed it? And what were the good things or the bad things about it? Yeah, I, I don't remember really any bad things about it. I had pretty standard hardware, so I didn't have any hardware compatibility issues. Um, yeah, my, my wife still uses uh, Windows. I haven't convinced her to switch full time yet. Um, there's still time, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, the, nothing really went wrong. Like I said, everything I was using on a daily basis was already Linux. So it, there's been a couple of like hardware things that we've bought, like peripherals we've bought along the way that have been a pain. Um, printers were a huge pain back then. Uh, that, yep. that's actually improved to the point now where it's easier to install a printer most printers on Linux than it is on Windows. Yep. You, most distros that you install today, like if you install a distro, your printer is going to be recognized automatically. Yeah. So. And like, you don't even have to do stuff sometimes. I had, uh, I had my laptop in 
uh, at a company that had one of those big like Xerox multifunction printers that's the size of a desk. Yep. And I went to print something at one point and realized that it was already recognized, installed, and ready to print. And I'd never told it to do anything because it was a network printer. It just saw it on the network, found out what it was, and made it available to print. Yep. So you install Ubuntu, you're into Linux now. Are you 100% Linux then? Or do you like switch yeah, back and forth? From, from the time that I installed it on my machine, I've pretty much been 100% Linux since then. Companies I've worked at have given me Windows workstations. Um, and in those cases, I would either use the same applications that I use at home, or sometimes I would just run Ubuntu in a virtual machine full screen. And I only used Windows to run, um, uh, what, what's the, the, the Windows email client? Outlook. Outlook. Because that was the only thing that I, I really had trouble with is getting um, evolution to connect to the exchange servers. Right. Have you ever used Mac or are you a Mac guy at all? Or? I have never used a Mac. I, I have used an Apple II. Um, I've used other people's Macs for very brief periods of time, um, but, but never any significant use. Not because I don't like Mac or Mac OS, it's just because I don't have one. <laughs> I can't justify the cost of the hardware. Like when I compare the cost of a Mac to the cost of like a, a, a Lenovo, you know, X series or the the Dell XPS. Right. I, I I just can't justify spending that much more for comparable hardware. Well, they are. There is a big price gap in between, so. Hey, what are you going to do? Yeah. And if I bought a Mac, I was just going to replace Mac OS with Linux anyway. Yep. So you, you said you started on Ubuntu or that's the, the first one for your desktop. Mm -hmm. Did you do a lot of distro hopping after that? Uh, did you Not try other ones? Not a lot, no. I tried, um, I think I tried an early Fedora and I tried uh, OpenSUSE for a little bit. But but I haven't really distro hopped around a whole lot. Right. So what is your desktop environment of choice? Just the GNOME, I guess, with Ubuntu or? Uh, it is now. It's, uh, I, I've, so my, I really like Unity. I know that might be a controversial thing, but in my mind, it was the best uh, desktop user experience. It got out of my way. It always for the most part, did what I expected it to do when I expected it to do it. Uh, it never felt like I was having to learn it. It always felt like it was all, already doing what I wanted it to do. I I've agree. Got, I've got GNOME now, um, but I've got plugins to try and make it as Unity-like as I can. I don't blame you there. It was very smooth at the time, so. Yeah, it, it wasn't necessarily very fast, uh, but but it did work well. And I still miss some of the features. Like I really, really miss the HUD feature yes. where you could search the menus. Working in GIMP and Inkscape without that is just so much harder. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because some, some distros have tried to like bring that kind of uh, thing back, like that kind of atmosphere back with the HUD, but it just never yeah, seems no, to you work. Got You've got to patch the toolkit. You know that Canonical caught a lot of flack for that. For when you know when Unity was being developed, there was a lot of patches on top of GNOME to make these things work because that was the only way to get the information that was needed. Right. Well, let's talk some Linux conferences for a little bit here. So you are or have been going to Linux conferences for. A long time you've been to a ton of them mm -hmm. so which one is your favorite wow um <laughs> like asking me to pick my favorite child here <laughs> well it's obviously the dog <laughs> obviously <laughs> <laughs> so the, there are conferences i like for the conference and there are conferences that i like for the people 
So I, I really like going to scale, but I really like going to scale in a large part because that's where I get to see most of my friends again. Um, I, I just came back from All Things Open earlier this week, which is on the other coast. It's in uh, North Carolina in Raleigh. And it had the same kind of feel and a bunch of my friends there. So now I've got these two big conferences on either coast where I get to see people. So um, what is that conference about? Uh, it, it's, it's all things open. It's about open source. It's not Linux specifically, although there is a very heavy Linux presence there. Um, but it, it's basically, it's like scale. Okay. Now, in terms of the conferences that I like, the conferences, um, I would say my favorite one has been UbuCon Europe in, um, in Germany. It was just, it was such a relaxing, fun, friendly conference to go to. It was one of the few that I left feeling recharged instead of uh, drained. That is a good thing. It was. Yep. Now, you, you have given talks at many conferences as well, too. Mm-hmm. So what are some of those talks you've, been, you've given? They're usually about whatever it is I'm developer advocating for at the time. You know, that, that's a big part of the job is going out and getting information about whatever project or product you're working on. Um, so most of them have been about that, usually geared towards showing people ways that they can start using it and what they can get out of it. So when, uh, w- when I really first started doing this, it was about writing desktop applications for Ubuntu. Um, so it was you know, tutorials on how to get started, get to a hello world kind of program as quickly and easy as possible. Um, and and kind of stuck with that pattern for most of the talks that I've given. Very nice. So um, you've been to, um, you know, you said Ubicon, you've been to um, OSCON. Mm-hmm. Um, what is that? like what is the atmosphere there oscon was big first of all and oscon didn't really have the same kind of community feel to it that like uh, a scale has one of the things i like about scale is that you get a lot of people who are not there for work in attendance that they're just there to learn, to find out what's new, to talk to people. It's very much a, a learning kind of conference and not at all a sales kind of conference. So do you, do you attend any conferences not work-related? I mean, do you just, is there some you just go to just because Michael Hall wants to go to one? or Not typically because, you know, that costs money. And <laughs> if that's if true. I'm there for work, that costs my money. <laughs> Um, so I, I've been to a couple conferences. If there's something within driving distance of me, I'll go to that. Um, but that hasn't happened too often. Right. So I went to, uh, I went to self one year because I was already traveling up in North Carolina area anyway. So I thought, yeah, I'll stop in. Um, and I've gone to a couple in Florida that were within driving distance on my own. Well, the only conference that I've ever been at was self, and that was this past this past June. Yeah, and it was totally awesome. It was it was so awesome to get to, like you had said earlier, meet your friends yeah. and people you talk to all the time. Well, if you can get to all things open next year, it's you know same general area. It's a little bit further east than Charlotte, um, but it, it's they had more than five thousand people there this year. It was almost too big. Oh wow. But a, a lot, a lot of good talks there. They they did a really good job with their talk selection. There's a variety of speakers and topics there, and all the ones that I went to were were really well done. Well, again, the conferences are like some. If you if people have never attended one, they should. If they're like hesitant about yeah. it, they should. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the conferences like self, you know, they don't either they don't charge admission just to show up or they charge a very low ticket price to show up um and they're they're a great way to to learn about a lot of things in a short amount of time 
they're a great way to meet people and make connections in the industry. Yep. Well, let's talk about uh, your development and your uh, the projects that you've worked on. So, you know, you had mentioned you got started uh, by web development. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a favorite project that you worked on? No, I think my favorite project's always the one I'm currently working on. It's like my taste in music and food. I, you know, whatever's in front of me is what I like the best at any given point in time. <laughs> well, a particular project that you worked on was called Chemo. Chemo, Chemo Linux. Yeah. Chemo Linux. Like Chemo, like Eskimo. Eskimo. Okay. Um, so tell us about that because that has an interesting uh, story of why it started, how it started, and what it was yeah. there for. So we started that, um, my wife and I actually started that together when my son was probably four years old or so. He would see us on our computers all the time and, you know, kids love to emulate their parents. So he wanted to do stuff on computers and neither of us wanted to just let him fiddle around with our desktops. (laughs) You Um, weren't that brave? (laughs) We were not that brave, no. Um, But I thought, hey, you know. I can just set him up, you know, a little Linux machine on some old PC. Um, I don't even remember where we got the PC that we first started this on, uh, but we had an old PC and I thought, Hey, I'll, I'll just put Linux on there. I'll put some big icons to some fun games because there's, there's a number of really good early elementary style games for kids that are open source. Um, I thought, yeah, I could do this. I could just make him something that he can play with. I'll put Tux Paint on there. There's G Compre. There's Child's Play. I got, so I put it together and I customized GNOME 2 so that it had just this big bar at the bottom with some big colorful icons on it. And he was able to figure out how to use the mouse to click on them and start the games. And it, it was pretty cool. He really enjoyed it. And then we would have friends come over with similar age kids and they would start to play on it. And they would say, do you make something like that for my kids? I've got an old PC sitting in the closet not doing anything. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. That was like, that was an afternoon kind of project. Like, yeah, I can do that. But by the time I'd done like three or four of these, making the same set of customizations every time and installing the same set of packages every time, and people keep asking me to do it again, like, I should really just make one image that's got all this done already. Yep. Uh, and if I had known how much work that was going to be at the time, I would have just kept doing it the way I was doing it. Because it turns out building and maintaining your own distro is a whole lot of work. <laughs> it is. <laughs> People don't realize how much work it is. Yeah. But, but I figured it out. And my brother, who I mentioned earlier as a graphics guy, came up with this really amazing artwork for us. Um, so if you ever see any of the like wallpapers or uh, you had some CDs made and stuff with this Eskimo character on it, um, that that just look amazing. And that really helped us too. You know, my first attempts at this were pretty ugly, um, but but that really added the polish that it needed to get people's interest and look like something that wasn't just a hack together thing. Yep. So uh, what happened to chemo? Or- Kimo, you know, why did you stop making it? Mostly because my kids outgrew it. You know, that it was it was a scratch your own itch kind of project and that itch went away. Um, not not just did they outgrow it, but by that time Unity was out. And one of the nice things about Unity is it had one big bar with big colorful icons on it, and it was easy to pin application icons to that. So, you know, at that point. I didn't need that customized interface anymore and installing a handful of apps was easy. And actually I left the the meta package that had the, uh, the dependencies on the games in the Ubuntu, uh, repos and, uh, the package with the artwork still in the Ubuntu repos. So I could take just a vanilla Ubuntu with unity and in a couple of commands have a very similar kind of environment. Right. Like I said, maintaining a distro is a whole lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So which do you like better, developing or community manager? I'm not sure I have to pick. <laughs> you don't have to pick. I'll just, dude, there, I mean, there's good things to both, right? When you're a developer advocate, you have to do both. I have to do development with the product that I'm trying to teach other people to do development with. So that's just, you know, that, that's a requirement. I have to do it. Um, and I, I still keep side projects around too. Um, I've always got some side projects to learn a new skill or scratch an itch or something going on. So even if, you know, my time becomes more focused on outreach and advocacy and community management, I never separate that entirely from development. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about Endless OS because you um, work there as well. What did you do for them? That was a little bit more strictly community management than developer advocacy. But one of the things that really drew me to Endless was um, their mission to try and make technology available to more people. One of the things that I wanted to accomplish with Kimo was to make technology available to you know, younger kids, make it available to um, kids on the autism spectrum because my son was diagnosed on that. Um, and we started a charity also to get people to donate old computers to us. We would put Ubuntu or Kimo on them and then we would donate them out to a family who needed them either because, like I said, their kid had a special need or just because they couldn't afford a computer of their own. And in the mid 2000s, you know, if you were growing up without a computer, you were being left behind. It was hard even to just keep up with regular education if you didn't have a computer at home that you could work on. So Endless's goal was that on more of a global scale. You know, they looked and saw, you know, there are countries with hundreds of millions of people in them that have a significantly lower percentage of people with computers than the United States does. And so they wanted to, to bring computers to them that they could use and that could be useful to them. And at that point, everything was on the internet. It was everything you wanted to do was online and not being online then was like not having a computer 10 years ago. The world was leaving you behind. And that's the harder thing to solve because you can't just roll out internet to, you know, a third of the world that doesn't have it. So their approach was to bring the internet offline and put it onto computers that could function the same way without having an internet connection. And they built some really cool tools that would do things like find the most viewed pages of Wikipedia, download them, compress the text, compress the images, and make it searchable through a desktop application so that you could have you know, 90% of what you would go look for on Wikipedia always available to you. Yep. And that's extremely important. You know, there, uh, Endless takes uh, a little bit of heat sometimes because of the size of the ISO. Um, but it's important to have all of that stuff there because if you think about not having the internet, I mean, you need pretty much, you, you need a ton of stuff in yeah. order to make it seem like you have the internet without actually having the internet. And the, the Endless ISOs, you know, if you if you get the full ISO with all of the content on it, yeah, it's going to be giant. Yeah, but the base endless OS ISO is no different than any other distro, really. Um, and w another really cool thing that they did, um, really kind of ahead of the game, was they had this uh, flat pack only desktop, so you couldn't install Debs or RPMs or anything like that. Everything was flat pack, and all the OS updates were from OS three. And that meant you couldn't break it. It meant that offline installation was easier. You can provide somebody you know, a thumb drive with flat packs on it and not have to worry about do they have the right you know, dependency packages already installed? Because again, yep. if they don't have internet, you're, you're out of luck if you don't have that. 
And now you'll see more projects with that. Uh, Sousa's got, I think, it's Cubic. Uh, Fedora now has Silver Blue. Um, Silver Blue, yeah. So, so others are starting to uh, to get on with that. And that was one of the things that Ubuntu wanted to accomplish um, when they were planning on merging the phone and Unity 8 back into the desktop, was to do the same kind of thing there. Yep. Well, recently on uh, Biddle, we did a distro challenge of Endless OS for two weeks. And I think it's such an awesome idea. Um, it's, you know, it's not the ISO or the distribution for everybody to just go download and run. It's not for me. Yeah. But, but for, the, for the people that they're trying to reach, I think it's an awesome idea and I love it. Yeah, that, that was a difficult messaging thing for Endless because Linux, desktop users were accustomed to every Linux desktop distro wanting to target them. And so when this, this thing came out that didn't target them, you know, they thought it was a failure and we had to explain that, no, it doesn't work for you because you're not who it was designed to work for. Right. Yep. It's definitely designed for a specific use case. And for that use case, it is great. And actually, I've got a, a great story for that because, um, you know, a, as the community manager, I ran it exclusively on my laptop. Um, that was all I ran at that point. And we got hit by a hurricane a couple of years ago, direct hit over my hometown, and we were without power for a few days. And we, we were dependent on our phones. The cell phone network came up after about a day. Um, but with no power to charge them, we were having to be like super frugal about what we use them for or else have to go to somebody's house who did have power. And at that point, I had a bunch of tinkering stuff. I had some Arduinos and some electronic bits and bobs. Uh, and one of the things I had was just a little solar panel. I was thinking, I wonder if I could use that to charge a phone. But I didn't know, you know, I... I cut a USB cable in half and I've got the two power lines and I've got a little multimeter, but I don't know what voltage you should provide to a cell phone to charge it. I can see what voltage I was getting from the, the uh, photovoltaic cell, but I didn't know if it was you know, what I needed it to be. And I had no internet to look that up with. And then I, I remembered, oh wait, I've got that Wikipedia app on my laptop. I wonder if it has a Wikipedia article about USB that might tell me what voltage and amperage the standard says to have. And sure enough, it did. And oh so, so I was able to find out that you know, I could, in theory, use this little photo cell to charge my phone. I spliced the, the wires up to it. Um, and, and I knew better than to plug it directly into my phone because you know, it would fluctuate as the clouds went across the sun. Um, but I plugged it into a backup battery and I let it sit outside for a few hours and it trickle charged the battery and then I can plug the battery into my phone and you know, top up my phone a little bit. It didn't save the day, but it was really cool that when I felt like stranded on a desert island without internet, that I was still able to find information that I didn't already know. Yep. Well, think about that for the people that Endless OS uh, is is for. Be, that kind of feeling is basically what they're able to, to do on a regular daily basis. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it awesome. You have um, done work for many companies. I know I won't ask you to pick a favorite. Um, do you have something like maybe a story about your community management? Something like you just relay, relayed to us with the uh, Endless OS story? There, there, there's a lot of little stories about just like the community coming together. I don't know if there's one that really stands out above the others. I mean, it, it's like there's, there's a constant current of community helping community, um, especially when it's really healthy and vibrant. Right. And so, you know, there's been times where, you know, there, there's been a tragedy, you know, somebody's lost a loved one, and a bunch of people who only know that person over the internet 
get together and figure out how to send flowers or something to them. Yep. You know, things that have nothing to do with the technology. It's just a very human connection. Well, I will always say that the community is the best reason to run Linux because Linux, ha it's funny. Um, I had saw a Linus Tech Tips tweet about um, reasons to run Linux now. And he was going to make a video and there was all these suggestions on what he should put in there. And I said, and I had tweeted about how, because it has a great community, unlike any other operating system out there. And I took a lot of bad tweets and hate because of that, <laughs> but <laughs> I will still say the community is the best reason to run Linux. Um, you have, uh, other reasons like open source software, like you, uh, is one of your main things, flexibility, customization. Mm -hmm. What is your main passion for Linux? My main passion stems to that first experience where I had to make my computer do something that it wasn't able to do. And just knowing that I can still do that. You know, whatever it is that I need to make my computer do, I can make it do it one way or the other. It might be harder sometimes than on Windows or Mac OS, but other times it's going to be possible on Linux when it won't be possible on those. So I wrote a, a, an article a while back because um, my wife had found this little USB microscope for sale online somewhere um, and ordered it for, for our kids. And we got it and we plugged it in to their Windows computer and it didn't recognize it. And we went to go find drivers for it. And I guess the company who made the chipset was no longer in, around. There were no drivers available. There was nothing we could do to get this USB microscope to work. And we, we didn't pay a lot of money for it. So it wasn't like a huge loss. It was more just annoying because we were excited, you know, hey, Here's a microscope, kids. Go put stuff under it and <laughs> look at bugs and stuff. Right. Um, and it didn't work. And so I thought, well, let me, let me plug it into my, uh, my Ubuntu laptop and see if it works. And so I plugged it in, and sure enough, nothing happened. No driver for it. But when I went and looked then, instead of seeing, you know, the company is out of business, you're out of luck, what I saw was somebody submitted a patch two years before to a kernel video driver that never got merged. And it was just a few lines to identify, you know, based on the, the serial number of the device as it came up on the on USB and say that, you know, this is a video device, use whatever kernel something it needed for that. It was a small patch. It never got merged because I guess nobody reviewed it or pushed it. But I was able to download that diff and apply it to my kernel, rebuild my kernel drivers, and it worked. And so, you know, that's not easy. That's certainly outside the realm of what most computer users are going to do. But instead of hitting a dead end, I had a path. It was a steep, narrow, rocky path, but it was a path. I wasn't just out of luck. And I think that's really what keeps me on open source is just knowing that I'm never going to be just out of luck. Yep. Well, we used to have a, a bad reputation in the Linux community. You've been around for a long time, so you've had to see some of the not so friendly people talk to some of the new users in Linux. Um, but how has your personal experience in the community been from the start? Um, with the actual community? Good, bad? On average, good, definitely. There have been a few bad people. Um, there have been some disruptive people. And even when I started, there were still a lot of communities that were not friendly and not welcoming. So I, I'm fortunate that I started in the Ubuntu community. Because if I had started in one that was not as friendly, I probably would have walked away. And, you know, that's true for a lot of people. A lot of people never get involved in open source or Linux because their first experience is a bad one. 
and it's so much easier to just walk away than to try and fight those battles. And a few people have fought those battles, and I think as an open source community, we owe them a lot for you know, sticking up for diversity and inclusion and acceptance and being friendly and not to everybody. You know, they, they caught a lot of flack, they got a lot of hate. I know of some of them who got a lot of death threats for doing it, but because they did it, it broke that stereotype and it let these you know, better communities grow out of that. Well, it was definitely some hardcore things going on back then, but we're getting better every year. And it's thanks to those people that you just talked about that we are. Uh, but what do you think is the one thing that we could do to make the whole experience better? Focus more on the people than the software. Like you said, the best part about Linux is the community. And if we make if we focus on the community and growing and nurturing the community, better software will follow. It doesn't necessarily work the other way around. Right. Let's go back to uh, Linux for a little bit. Do you have a certain workflow, um, whether it be software or hardware related? You know, you're a keyboard guy rather than a mouse guy. Do you have a certain workflow? I, I am largely a keyboard guy. Um, I, I memorize the, the keyboard shortcuts to the point where I don't have to think about it anymore. And that's probably one of the reasons I really liked Unity was because it was really super easy to drive from a keyboard. And, uh, and GNOME 3 is now too, and I don't have to use my mouse very much at all. Well, when you do use your mouse, are you a single click or double click user? <laughs> Uh, I am a double click user oh, geez, uh, <laughs> just because because I have a tendency to just click on things that I don't necessarily want to open. All right. Um, so you get a brand new computer. Mm -hmm. You install Ubuntu on it. What's the first software that you install that you got to have? Probably Thunderbird, I think would be because you still get uh, Firefox by default, I think, on Ubuntu. I haven't done a fresh install in a little while. Um, but I think you get it by default. So You do. Um, so a workflow that I developed back in the Unity days was I've got a specific order of uh, apps in my launcher so that I can just super one, super two, super three, go to them. And the first handful I have kept in the same order for five years or so now. So Firefox is always super one, Thunderbird is always super two. So when I go to install my, my typical app, it's usually in the order that I have them pinned on the dash. Okay, so Linux is pretty much everywhere. And it, you know, a lot of people think it's you know in the server world, and but it's not just in the server world. It's in so many other places. Um, from POS machines to uh, video rental machines. to I mean, it's, it's everywhere. But where exactly does Linux stand at in your mind? You know, it doesn't really stand out anywhere because like you said, it is everywhere. It's saying, you know, where does wood stand out? Oh, wood's <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think of one specific thing being made out of wood as standing out. Um, you know, it's really, it's gotten to the point where it's more interesting from a curiosity level if some piece of technology doesn't have Linux or open source on it. Like, that's the anomaly now. You know, it used to be I would look and say, oh, is this device running Linux? And now it's like, well, of course it is, because you would be stupid not to run Linux on a device anymore, because... It's been proven. It works. Everyone knows it. Everyone knows it works. And you don't have to pay for it. But it kind of snuck up on you like that. I remember when, um, when Ubuntu came out with the Ubuntu phone. Um, and uh, I, I was an, an early, early adopter of that back before it was ready to adopt. And I had some, some hard times. But I remember uh, a family member who I won't name uh, picking on me about the... Uh, 
about my new Ubuntu phone. Um, and this person, they, they didn't really know what Linux was, but they knew it was something that you can pick on nerds about. And so they remember, I remember them specifically saying, who would even want Linux on a phone? And I had to say, you, you do. <laughs> that phone you have, that Android phone you're so happy with, is running Linux. Like you're making fun of me for it, but you didn't even know you have it. That's yeah. how you know that that's how pervasive it is now. Well, let me ask you, um, you've been around Linux for so long. Um, and everybody that I'm sure that you come in contact with in your working basis uh knows about Linux. But what about your friends uh and your local contacts? Um, do they do they give or do all of them give you a hard time like that or, or are there some no. that no some do you know that i my friends they pick because they love and i get a lot of love sometimes <laughs> um but uh yeah linux not many people really know about um and it's not really something that comes up much i found that talking to people about open source is a lot easier than talking to them about linux because one, there's never been that, you know, open source is something you can pick on nerds about that you had with Linux. But also, you know, the, most people's first introduction to open source was Firefox, which not only was a very good piece of open source, but its proprietary competitor was so awful that nobody thought about open source as being a bad thing or something that only nerds use. Um, so being able to talk to them about open source through Firefox was a lot easier than talking about Linux specifically. Right. So act like I'm the, I'm the guy that doesn't know. What would you say to me about open source to convince me to use it? So you know how you have things that you use on a daily basis that were designed by an idiot because they don't do this thing that you want it to do. Like, you know, you've got a kettle that doesn't work quite right. And then, you know, why would anybody design it this way? It's stupid. It's an easy fix to make this so much easier to use. Now imagine you're actually able to make that fix and it doesn't cost you a lot to do. You're going to make it right. Yep. And say you don't know how to make that fix to that kettle, but you know it's broken. And there's a thousand other people with the same kettle and the same problems. And there's another thousand people who have the knowledge and ability to make that fix for everybody. So now all you need is one person with the knowledge to make that fix. And that person can then help these thousands of people with this poorly designed kettle. You know, it just makes sense that you do it. It helps everybody. You help yourself. You improve the state of the art without having to wait for this company who's already made their money off of this kettle. You've already bought it. It's not like you're going to go out and, you know, rebuy it if they fix it. So they've got no incentive to do it. It's the people who are using it who have the incentive to do it. And when you've got the people with the ability to fix it too. And you know, with software being free to make duplicates of, it means that we can advance the technology so much faster than we could otherwise. Well, I love that whole thing because the, and the reason that I ask you is because there are a lot of people, including myself sometimes, who wanna to talk to people about Linux or open source and don't exactly know how to present it the right way. Mm -hmm. And that is a perfect example of presenting it in the right way where you could, where it relates to people, where it's not just, I'm going to sell you something. Yeah. And I, I have a similar explanation for what community management in open source is. So, so that when you're a community manager in open source, your job is when a bunch of people come to you and say, this kettle design is stupid. I could have been, made a better kettle design than this. My job is to say, 
yes, you can. Here's how. Show me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> how many people take you up on that? <laughs> a lot. Because, you know, it, yeah, it starts out as complaining. People love to complain. But when you show them how easy it is, and in a lot of cases it is pretty easy, to fix the thing that they're complaining, not just fix it for themselves, but fix it for other people and get credit for doing that. You know, it's it's a powerful uh, um, offer to make. All right. Um, so your your work that you do now um, for the Linux Foundation, mm -hmm. um, what is it that you do on a daily basis? On a daily basis, I'm helping engineers in companies who are building IoT and edge-related software and devices. So I'm outside of what I have done in the past, which has really been going directly to users and community people. Um, not many average people are interested in edge computing on an industrial scale as a side hobby because that's expensive and relatively boring as far as side hobbies go. So, so my focus has mostly been people inside engineering teams, inside companies who are trying to build a product and they need some plumbing to get things working right. And they don't want to spend time reinventing plumbing themselves. So I show them the plumbing we already have and teach them how to use it and show them how to use these different projects together to skip over that amount of work and get down to the things that they actually want to build. Very nice. Let's talk about get together. So I mentioned uh, at the beginning that my start in the Ubuntu community was this local team portal. Um, and my first set of features that I added to this was actually event planning capabilities. So before that, it was a list of what the teams were and where they were and who was on them. But they wanted a way to you know, say what events that they were going to hold. And, you know, Meetup costs money, and Ubuntu has always operated on kind of a shoestring budget, especially in the community. We did a lot with very little money. And so one of the first community contributions I made was turning it into something that teams could use to plan and promote and organize events. And it worked out really well and, and got a lot of use. And Years later, um, when I was at Endless OS and involved in the GNOME community, they wanted something similar too. And again, they didn't want to use Meetup because it cost money and it wasn't open source. Um, they had been mostly using the wiki at that point to track their events, like release parties and stuff. So I went to a, a Guadec, which is the big uh, annual GNOME conference. Uh, and we had a, a session after hours one night about you know, what can we do for growing local communities? And people were saying, you know, it'd be great if we could use Meetup or something like it to plan events. Like, well, you know, we've got this, this Ubuntu thing over here. It's really, it's very tied to Ubuntu right now, but, you know, we could use that software or something similar and tailor it to be what GNOME needs. And there was general agreement that, yeah, that something like that would be great, you know, but who's going to do it? We should... It, there's a lot of oftentimes planning things to death. Um, and so I just said, okay, well, you know what? I'll just bootstrap something. I'll get something up and going um, to avoid you know, be, being stuck in planning stages. Um, so, so I started building this thing for GNOME, and I was thinking, you know, I don't want it to be just for GNOME. I want anybody else to be able to use it. You know, Debian community could use it. Um, any, anyone else could. So, so I start making it a little bit more generic and a little bit more generic. And I'm thinking, well, maybe somebody wants to host their instance and they want to host their instance, but you, know, you want to be able to share the event information. So it, design it so that it'll work with that. Um, and originally, I was just going to host kind of like a test instance, like a, a showcase instance of it expecting that everybody else was going to run their own so 
so I spun up this one and, and I couldn't find a short domain for it. So it's gettogether.community. Uh, and I put the website up there when it was barely more than a handful of pages that didn't do anything. Uh, a little, almost two years ago now, uh, it was January of uh, 2018 that I launched it. And again, it was just supposed to be a site where I ran the latest version of the code and people can see it and try it out and decide that they want to run their own instance. But people started just putting their own teams on there and starting their own events and just using it as a service. And more and more teams started doing that, even as I was still you know, just doing development daily on this production server. And it just kind of continued that way to now there's over 300 teams using this one instance and like 1,700 oh, wow. users on it. Um, it, it, it's, it followed a very slow, steady growth, word of mouth um, for a year and a half. And then earlier this week, Meetup made an announcement that they were trialing a new payment model where they were going to charge attendees $2 to say that they're going to attend an event. And everybody panicked because, you know, a lot of people that use Meetup, they're willing to pay the $10, $15 a month to run their group, but all of their events are free events. And they don't want to charge their, their attendees $2 to go to the event. And they don't want to cover the $2 per attendee cost just to host this event on Meetup. So everybody starts looking for alternatives. And there's several of them out there already. Uh, mine was one of them. And so I saw a huge spike in growth uh, over the past week because of that. Wow. That is awesome. So tell us, tell us exactly how it works. You sign up with uh, your group and how's that work? Yeah, it, it works a lot like Meetup does. You sign up, you create a team, and then inside your team, you create events. And you're, you know, you, you're trying to build up a community around your team that has these multiple events that some people in that team will come and attend. That's really just there to support local communities and their activities. I've made some tweaks to, uh, to the way it works based on feedback. Uh, some people say, I just want to host a one-off event. I don't want to create a team for it. Uh, so you can host an event just as yourself instead of as part of a team. Uh, I've created some, recreated some of the Meetup Pro features where you can have one organization that controls multiple teams. So that's still in kind of heavy development, but uh, there's, like, there's, there's a Linux users group organization where I've been trying to collect all of the Linux user group teams around the globe into this one set. So you can see all the teams, all of their events. You've got a nice map with dots of where they're all located. Um, and one of the things that I pulled from the Ubuntu portal uh, was one of the th Ubuntu would do these global jams, which coincided with uh, every release that came about four or five weeks before the actual release. And the intention was to get all of the Ubuntu community around the globe to do a little bit of work on that release. Translations, fixing bugs, triaging, just general Q&A, whatever. But the idea was we'll make one event that the global community can participate in. And because we already had this portal where teams can do their own events, we set it up so that we could list this global event, and then under there, you would have all of the individual team events. And so I recreated that um, and get together also. So it's got a lot of the same functionality of Meetup, a few things that are unique that I pulled in from, uh, from Ubuntu and other uh, suggestions that people have given me. That's pretty awesome, man. And it's all for the community, and that's the best it's part. It's all for the community and all by the community. Um, when, it, when I first started, I wasn't sure how to fund it. Um, and I, I did some polls online and I tried, I, I was at first going to do a freemium model where I'd say, okay, you get this base set of features for free. And if you want things like this organizational support, um, or, or sponsors on your event, then you pay a small monthly fee to get that. And that really didn't fit my open source, uh, ethos. 
where I wanted to make everything that I built available to anybody who wanted it. So I pulled the plug on that and I ripped out all of the code that would turn off features if you were not a premium member and decided to make all the features available to everybody for free and just put up a, a Patreon and ask people to cover the cost of hosting through donations. And for the last year, most months, I have had enough donations come in to pay my, uh, my AWS bill. So that's worked out really well. Well, that was one of the things I was going to ask you about the server costs and whatnot. So I will definitely put a link to your Patreon in the show notes. Thank you. We, we have had, you know, like I said, we had a huge spike in traffic. It has been taxing the, the instances that it's currently running on, but so far uh, hasn't caused any outage or anything which has been nice. And we have had some more pledges come in as people are, are joining on. So I'm confident that we'll be able to keep uh, covering the server cost, even with this new influx of traffic. Very nice. So is there something that is that you can tell us is coming as a feature or something new that's coming to? Not really. I mean, it, it all happens in the open. There's no big surprise reveals or anything. You want to know what features are being worked on is just look at the GitHub issues and see which ones are, are being active. Um, and I've so far pretty much maintained that the website follows what's in the master branch. So I don't queue up a whole bunch of changes and then push out a new release every six months. Um, I'll push new releases out to the server as they land in Git. It's not automated. I still gatekeep that uh, and you know make sure that everything's still working properly before it gets pushed out. But I try and keep the, the live website as up to date with the code base as I can. So it's a rolling release. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, the, the features that have landed in the past week have all been about um, controlling the influx of new uh, people who have come in. Uh, unfortunately, we did get some of the bad actors coming in too. And uh, so w when I designed the email notifications, I, I wanted to avoid them being used for spamming people. So I put some controls in place that you had to have a confirmed email address before the system would send out anything for you. Um, and if you are sending to an email address instead of to uh, another user account, that it would only send out uh, system-generated emails. It would not let you send arbitrary text. But a vector I didn't consider was that the, the, the team invite, where you can say, you know, send this email address an invitation to join my team. Those emails contained the team description as part of everything else. And so somebody came in and he created this team whose description was just a spam ad. And then he just started sending invites to people to join this team because the text of that spam would be in the email. Uh, and he did, he did that overnight one night, and I woke up and found out that he had sent out like 5,000 of these invite emails uh, before I caught it. So I shut that down, and I put limits in place, uh, how many emails you can send. I had to put email block list in place, because like I said, I required a confirmed email address, and he had a confirmed email address. In fact, I'd five confirmed email addresses uh, from some bizarre domains. So I've had to put blacklists in place to try and um, you know, prevent people from using email addresses from these domains to sign up for accounts. Uh, we had one hate group create a group in uh, Australia. Well, they'll... There is the, the, we have a code of conduct, and I do enforce the, adhering to that code of conduct. And so I got a report and checked it out and was able to delete that pretty quickly. People will always try to find a way around it, man. They will. And like I said, you know, almost two years, I never had an incident. But uh, as soon as it became more widely known instead of just word of mouth to trusted people, then you, you get all kinds. Yep. Well, I want to thank you for that work in the work that you're doing, because like I said, I love the fact that it's for the community. I've I've enjoyed writing it. I enjoy making it available to the community. I am 
really, really grateful that the community has stepped up and donated their money to make sure that this isn't all being paid for by me. Um, that really makes it easier for me to continue wanting to grow this project, knowing that it's not going to be a financial burden. Right. Well, plus, this is a lot of work, too. Yeah. This well, is a lot I mean, of work on your part. I, I'm not getting paid for my work. It's, uh, you know, I contribute it as a volunteer because I care, just like any of the other developers who have contributed to it so far. Oh, I just, I don't want it to result in me sending more of my money every month to Amazon because they get enough of my money every <laughs> month. Uh but at least for those, I get packages in the mail. Yeah, right. You get you a know, gift. The, the, knowing that the community is behind it and that they want it to stick around enough that they're willing to contribute that to it um, really means a lot and shows that you know what, what I'm doing is valuable and worth continuing. It is. Trust me, it is. It is worth continuing. So from all of your time in developing and community management and if somebody wants to get involved but they don't know how whether that be in developing or whether that be helping out in other areas like community management what mm -hmm. would you say to them the first step especially if it's software the first step is always to become a user first so a lot of people will you know want to get involved in a project like it say it's a web project the first step is to get your local development environment running because almost any contribution you're going to make is going to be easier if you already have that going. Development, obviously, you're going to have to have uh, a local development environment to make it work. If you're doing design work for a product, being able to run those designs um, and actually try them out is going to be a huge benefit. But even if you're just advocating it, or writing documentation for it, having the experience is going to make that a lot easier and, and give you a lot more of the information that you need to make those contributions. So start using it and uh, start from there. Yeah. Uh, does that include uh, other areas like community management and stuff? Yeah. I mean, if you want to get involved in community management, the first step is to get involved in the community. You have to be a community member before you can become a community leader. Uh, and, and some people do try and jump into a community and reorganize it and redirect it, and that always ends terribly. Uh, you, can't, you can't lead a community by command. You have to lead by persuasion, and that means you have to build up a reputation that people will trust so that when you say, hey, we should do this, they don't really need to be convinced why this is something good to do because they trust your knowledge and your judgment already at that point. That if you're saying this is a good idea, that yeah, it's probably a good idea and we'll support you in that. Yep. I would agree. I would also say that being being an example would be the other quality that you have to have. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so well, Everybody's learning. We're learning new stuff all the time. Uh, how do you learn? Like if say you're going to tackle a new project, um, do you learn best by reading documentation or do you learn best by watching somebody or what's the best no, way? I learn best by building. So if I want to learn a new programming language, I can go through the, the tutorial to make a Hello World program but I'm not going to learn that language until I have written a useful program in it. So something that's relevant to me or my interest that I'm building with this technology, because that forces me to learn things that are not necessarily written down in the step-by-step -step instruction. And I have to dig into things and I have to understand how pieces fit together in one way so that I know how to make them fit together in the way that I want. I'm, I'm the kind of person who I can't learn by memorizing something, which really sucked in school. Um, but if I can understand how something works, then I can always know 
how it's going to work and how to use it. Yep. What do you think of when I say the year of the Linux desktop? <laughs> um, I actually, I did a talk a couple of years uh, about this. The year of the Linux desktop, and I, I said this uh, in my talk, I made the, the prediction. When we have 30,000 desktop applications available to users, that will be the year of the Linux desktop. That will be the tipping point from being a niche operating system to something that people have to think about. And yeah. it wasn't just a random number. I looked at the, the growth and adoption rate of uh, um, Mac OS, uh, iOS, Android, um, to look at, you know, what, at what point did they go from a slow, gradual growth to taking off? And it was always at around that point. Magic number. It, pretty much, yeah. I think it's when there's that many applications that you, you have a solution to enough users in a market that you are relevant to more application developers. You know, that's the, that's the critical mass. Once you have that many apps, then new apps have to start thinking about your platform. Yep, they have to get serious about it. Yeah. All right, so if you could change one thing about Linux, what would it be? Did we ask this question already? Because mm -hmm. my answer is going to be um, focus more on the people than the software. Do it. And, and you know, that, I know I've already used that answer once already. Um, but yeah, focus on the users and the contributors and making it better for them and the rest will follow. All right. So thinking back on the reasons why you chose to run Linux, you, at one point you made the decision I'm running Linux because mm -hmm. of this. Do those reasons still apply today? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I didn't start using it because it was objectively better or easier to use at that point in time because it wasn't at that point in time. I think it probably is now for, for a large percentage of users. I think a, a large number of Windows users could switch to Linux and be just fine. Um, but for me, it was always about what can I do with it? Can I do more with Linux than with something else? And I think that's still true. Yep, it is. Michael, how can people get in touch with you? You can email me. I think uh, my email's publicly a lot of places now, so I'll just say it's mhall119 at gmail.com or mhall119 on pretty much any social network system anywhere. Uh, I've been using that username for a long time now and trying to use it everywhere I can. Very nice. Um... I want to, again, thank you for all of the work that you've done, not just with uh, Get Together, but all through the years, from the development standpoint to contributing your time and effort, regardless of getting paid or not. Um, it's a long history of giving back to the community, and I want to thank you for that. Well, you're, you are more than welcome. I mean, we, we're all doing this together. Everybody does a little bit. They do what they're talents and experience suits them for, uh, and that helps everybody. I mean, your show is helping everybody by doing that. So you know, th thank you for doing that. Thank everybody in the community for the contributions that they make. You know, we don't say it nearly enough. Even, even if we say it a lot, we don't say it enough. Uh, thank you to the people who are building the things that they're building. Definitely don't say it enough. Even a simple thank you will do. Yeah, it, it goes a long way. Like it goes, you don't know how important a thank you is until you don't get it. And then, you know, then you feel it. So, you know, make, always make sure to thank the people who are doing things that make your life better or happier. 
Agreed. All right. That wraps up our discussion. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. Until next time, long live Linux.